Let me ask you a question um, this morning. Have you ever felt like nobody understands you? Thank you, Martin. Have you ever felt like nobody gets you? Like nobody knows what's going on. Nobody, nobody can relate to you. Um, I have a, a preteen now. And even when she was like six, I remember her saying, nobody understands me. I'm like, you're six years old. What do you, what, what, what? you guys remember teenage years feeling like maybe as an adult, you feel like people get you maybe, but like as a teen feeling like nobody understands who you are, nobody can relate to you. You're the only one in the world with your problems. Have you ever thought that if I try to explain how I feel or what I'm thinking that or what I've done or where I've been, it's too, humil- too humiliating, too embarrassing, too risky. It'd be too vulnerable for me to say this to somebody. So I have to keep this all to myself. I have to live in my own little island and nobody gets me. Anybody ever just feel that way. Everybody's like, I'm not putting my hand up because I'm the only one who will do it. Thanks. We have two people. All of us have felt that way at some point, maybe in our adult life, maybe as a kid, maybe as a teen. We've all felt like nobody gets me. I I remember as a teen feeling that way multiple times. And usually now looking back as an adult, it was the silliest situations ever. Like, that situation made me feel completely alone. Now as an adult, I'm like, that's nothing. Like, I can, I can get through that again if I need to. I'd rather have that than this now. Does it ever feel that way? Like, looking back. We, we go through that, and this morning, I, I want you to understand that we have all felt this crazy gap between us and the rest of the world at some point in our lives. We've all felt completely disconnected and alone. And, and if we feel that way about other human beings that we live and breathe the same air with, how more likely is it for us to feel that way about the God over us? Like if the person beside me doesn't get me, how could God ever get me? How could he relate to me? How could he connect to me? And if I share these things or if I'm transparent, how can he be good for me? How could, how could this not hurt me to expose how weird I am? Have you ever just felt weird? Like, I, I, I feel weird all the time. Like, my kids tell me I'm weird all the time. If, if you're a dad, you probably hear that. Or maybe it's just me. And then I'm, I am the weird one. Maybe. Maybe that's the truth. But, like, sometimes we just feel so disconnected. And, and this morning, as we continue to walk through the book of Hebrews, I, I want you to see how we have Jesus, who is better than any, anyone else. And because of Jesus... The writer of Hebrews lets us know that we have a God who understands. We are not disconnected. We are not alone. We, there are people who get it. But more than that, there is a God who gets it. Would you go with me to Hebrews? We're going to pick up in verse 14 of chapter 4. And like I said at the beginning of the series, Hebrews is a wild book written so that the church would see Jesus and they would hang on to faith and they wouldn't go back into their old religion, their old way of thinking, their old operating systems. They would cling on to Jesus. And so we, we continue to discover who Jesus is and how he is better than anything else in this passage. But like I said at the beginning, this journey is kind of intimidating for Pastor Ben and myself. Like we, we realize there's a lot in this and we could get really sidetracked and go down a lot of different ver- various paths. And I said sometimes we'll go verse by verse and sometimes we'll go section by section. And my desire is to complete this book before Christmas. So today I'm going to take you on kind of a wild sporadic journey letting you see the main points, but there's a lot more that you could really dig into in your own. Make sense? So I'm not going to cover every verse in this massive section here this morning, uh, just giving you that warning right up front. So we're going to jump around a little bit, starting in verse 14 of chapter 4. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, 
to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We're going to pause there um, with that section. And then I want to jump real quickly to chapter 7, verse 1. Let's read this in chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. We'll stop there. There's a lot in that passage that I just read, and, and there's a name that popped up in this passage, Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Uh, Pastor Ben was trying to convince me to say Melchizedek and just see if anybody corrected me, I said, I bet I could say it 10 different ways throughout the sermon and see if anybody noticed. But I decided not to do that to you and cause confusion. It's Melchizedek. That's, that's how it is. So let me, let me explain what's happening here. So he's writing to this group of Hebrews, the people who understood Jewish religion who are now followers of Christ. And there is a priestly system that they are familiar with. They understand. The priestly system expressed an internal feeling that they needed someone to represent them before God. Their connection felt broken, and they wanted slash needed a representative. God's people in the Old Testament, God asked his people to come to him, and they said to Moses, no, you go on our behalf. Why? Because every other religious system, all the, 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 all the other cultures that they knew, they saw people who could not fully approach God. They needed somebody to go behalf on their behalf. They needed someone to represent them. Let me, let me bring it into practical understanding of how many of you guys, I mean, for those parents in here should know this, this illustration. My kids go outside and play. They're playing with the neighbors. And I don't know who brings it up, but one of them brings up, hey, can we have popsicles, right? Somebody outside thinks we should have popsicles. It's 10 in the morning. We need popsicles right now. Who comes into the house to my throne called my recliner in front of the TV and says to dad, can we have popsicles? Who does that? It's the, it's who? No, never the oldest in my house. It's the youngest, the cutest, the sweetest, the gentlest, the one that we have much more mercy and grace for. Her name is Grace. We give her Grace. She is Grace, my five-year-old. It's always Grace who gets sent to do the dirty work for the other kids. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's always that youngest. And they come in all innocent, and they ask questions that I know they never even thought of. Like, that, that, this kid never thought to ask that, ever. But there's a group of kids outside the door, the screen door, just listening to see if they get approval for popsicles. Right? Why? Because they know if the oldest who didn't clean the dishes earlier today, comes in and says, can I have popsicles for all the neighborhood? I'm probably going to say no, tell them to go home and get their own popsicles. But if Grace comes and she gives me that sweet little face, right, and she's still got her blankie in her hand and, and a stuffed piggy in her arm, I might say yes. This is what we have been doing forever. 
Mankind has said, we cannot approach God because we know our own issues. So we will find somebody to do it for us. God will somehow select this one person, this priest, who is good enough to go before him and somehow hear his voice and give us approval, to give us pardon, to forgive us. And, and if I think about this, who was the priest? Aaron. Aaron was this priest, right? You have Moses and Aaron. What, what did Aaron do? I'm pretty sure he had people make a big, a big statue of a cow, right, to serve other gods. He's winning, right? No. We've always wanted somebody to represent us. And so what we have in Scripture is we see this great high priest, this, this king who's also a priest named Melchizedek. And in the Old, the Old Testament, we only, our first reference to him is in Genesis chapter 14, where Abraham goes to rescue his family Lot from the kings of Sodom and, and other cities. He goes to rescue them, and the kings of Sodom, actually no, he rescues with the, the people of the kings of Sodom, he helps get their money back. And Sodom, the king says, I will give you all these treasures. I'll give you this because you rescued my people and your kinsmen. And Abraham says, no, I don't want your money because then it will be known and I will feel like you gave me money rather than the God of the universe, rather than the true God. And so what he does, is he, so he rescues these people, he gives them back all that stuff, and he goes and finds this priest. He seeks after this priest, Melchizedek, and gives him a tenth and blesses the Lord through that. You are a representation of the Lord for our people. So Moses gives, or Abraham gives this offering to Melchizedek. We don't really know anything else about him. He just shows up. He's this king, and he's a priest, he just kind of shows up, and we don't hear anything else about him until Psalms chapter 110, a thousand years later. That's it. We, 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 don't, we don't know anything else about him, and here he shows up now in Hebrews chapter 4, 5, and 7. He pops up and says that Jesus is a king and a priest just like Melchizedek was, but he's better. He is the better king and priest. So we should understand this morning what that means. Because if you see in chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews fully expects the hearers to understand who Melchizedek was and what that means for them. He fully expects them to know and live like they know what it means to have Jesus as a king and priest. I want you to think for a second, though. Nobody else in the Old Testament were both king and priest. We had priests. We had kings. We had prophets. But we didn't have a king priest, except Melchizedek. Just for a second, think what that would look like today. Where you had a king running a nation who was also the spokesperson for God. I, I know that in England, the queen was the head of the church, right? And go back to Constantine. He kind of proclaimed himself as the head of this new church. But both those things were pretty ugly. Imagine today... If we had this priestly system where you as congregants would come to me with your sins and your questions and say, I need God's appeal for this, and then you would come to me and then I would go to Biden, our president, who's also this high priest. And I would say, Biden, could you appeal to God? Or what if we did a few years ago and we said, Trump, would you appeal to God? And then would you speak to me so I can speak to the people and see if God will forgive us? Just a matter, and I'm not trying to like bash on Biden or Trump. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. But just think how ugly that would be. I don't want either of those guys going before me to God and then coming back and God said, God said no. God, and God said not today. I'd be like, how, how did you explain that to him, President Trump, President Biden? How, how did you say that to God, right? That would be ugly right? We don't do that. Why don't we do that? Because we have a great high priest named Jesus, and he's changed the game. He's changed everything for us. I can't fully relate to Biden or Trump, right? Like, Biden's supposed to be from this area, and people were just vandalizing the sign that has his name on it now in the city. Like, Scranton doesn't get along with Biden fully. 
right? What if we still had that operating system? I can't fully relate to these people. You can't fully relate to me. I can't fully relate to you. But what does this passage say about Jesus? For we, ha- we do not have a great high priest. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted just as we are yet without sin. So let us then go with confidence to the throne of grace. We have Jesus who gets us. Jesus who fully understands We have a priest who has suffered with us. This word, sympathize, here in the ESV, in the Greek is sympatho. It's literally the same word, sympathou. However, sympathou, thou, like Melchizedek, Melchizedek, whatever you want to say is fine with me today. You could have laughed there. That was, you guys all right? You guys all right? That word, though, to sympathou, sympathy is what we we get. It means to suffer alongside of. To suffer with. That part of me suffers as you suffer. We have Jesus who has come and he suffers with us in every way that we have felt anguish, suffering. In every way that we have felt alone, uh, like the outcast, like the oddball, like the weirdo, like the, the broken person. In every way, Jesus has sympathized. He suffered with us. So we can go before God with confidence knowing that someone has felt this for me. And they have already come and stood before God, perfect and clean, and God said, I approve this. I I recognize that, that I see them in you because I see your suffering, so therefore I see their suffering. I see them, so we can boldly approach God. We don't approach God's throne with groveling. We approach it with worship and humility, absolutely, because he is fully worthy and he's done all the work. I don't, I don't come in arrogance, but I come in boldness. I don't walk before God, the Father of the universe, with trepidation, waiting for him to reject me or waiting for him to punish me. But because of Jesus, the great high priest who understands me, I get to approach God with confidence, knowing that his throne is described as a throne of mercy and grace. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that, 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 that is amazing that the scripture tells me I can come right in and approach God. I can have relationship with him without hesitation. I'm going to summarize chapter 5, verse 11 through 6, 8. The writer says that all these things they should have already understood by now. It's the basic food of their Christian faith. They should have start, and because they understood this, they should now start living out mature faith that models the values of people who live before the throne. If I live in a place of confidence before the throne, it now empowers me to live different than what I lived like when I was full of fear, humiliation, and and brokenness. It makes sense. If you live in the throne room, you live different than somebody who lives in a shack down the street. And and the writer of Hebrews says, you guys should already get this by now. You you should already understand your position because if you lived in the throne room, you'd act like you're in the throne room. Your behavior begins to change. You model a new thinking, a new way of living. He says that, that they, what they need for their enlightened nature, their mature life that is found in Christ, that he is all they need. They already have all they need for maturity. But many never grow and they often walk away from the church. What, what this passage is not talking about, he's not trying to make a theological case for losing one's salvation. He's saying clearly to the church body that there are people who come in to the church, but they never grasp the beauty of Jesus and they walk away. I, I, as a pastor, I've seen this so many different times where people want spirituality. They want spiritual enlightenment. Or they want some divine problem solving. If I come to church and if I do this prayer and if I go through these motions, then God will fix all these things that are broken. He, he, he will be my emergency relief. But that's not maturity in Christ. 
That's not understanding Jesus as their great suffering high priest who went before them. And so what happens is their faith begins to crumble and they disappear from the church. I have seen this so many times. People come in with zeal saying they're doing a new thing and they're going to give everything to God. But what they're really doing is saying, if I do this for a month and a half, it'll cure everything. I made a joke before when I was a kid. I remember I was a teenager. I was at a, a church picnic and there was a guy standing there talking to my dad saying, yeah, this new Slim Fast stuff. Remember Slim Fast? Do they still make Slim Fast? I don't know. If, you, if you're still drinking Slim Fast, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm, I'm not going to make you do that. You could, but you don't have to. But Slim Fast, he said this. He's like, yeah, I drank it a few times. It didn't change anything. You got to do more than drink a Slim Fast. Like, you ain't going to get healthy and lose 40 pounds overnight by drinking a Slim Fast. And there's the same mentality spiritually. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, those who see the beauty of Jesus, the great high priest, the ultimate righteous and just king, they cling on to it and they continue to persevere in the faith. And they live like they're in the throne room and then they never slip away. Why? Because they're growing in maturity and they're seeing a life that looks like the throne room rather than looks like the streets. Makes sense. Let's read chapter 6, verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He's reminding them, you're not saved by your works, but we have a God who is so good and just that when you work and strive and begin to live out the kingdom lifestyle, God sees that and he says, I'm fanning into flame the promises of that. I'm, I'm not unjust to ignore what you've been doing for my name. You're not saved by your performance, but we have a God who sees and responds and blesses what you do when you live in that throne room mentality. When you live in a place knowing your son and daughter and maturing in your faith, hanging on to faith, living that lifestyle as spoken about in chapter 5 and 6, when you live that lifestyle, God sees it. He's not ignoring it. He's not letting go, and there is promises that will come into fruition when you live that way. We see in this passage that we have a God who is true in whatever he says. Whatever he says, God does not lie. The writer encourages growth and maturity by reminding them that what they do matters to God. It doesn't rescue you, but it matters. It's built on the tangible expression of every kingdom claim that we, the thing that we claim to believe. N.T. Wright talks about this this way. Like our, our promises in our Christian life, uh, what we do as we live in this throne room mentality, as we approach him and begin to model that to the world around us, he says this is what it looks like. We, we don't have faith in faith, as people suggest. He says Christian hope isn't optimism, a vague sense that things will probably turn out all right. Christian faith is trusting and going on trusting through thick and thin in the God who made unbreakable promises and will certainly keep them. Christian hope is looking ahead to a time when, according to those promises, God will make the world over anew, completing the work he begun in Jesus. And it's Jesus on whom, on whom the whole thing rests. It's all about Jesus, he says. The cr Christian hope isn't worldly optimism. It's confidence knowing that God doesn't lie, and when God sees what we are doing, he has promises to bring his kingdom fully in, and it ultimately rests on Jesus. God will do everything he has declared he will do, and we will see that when we cling on to him. 
We'll discuss our eternal hope more next week. But for this week, I want you to see that the writer of Hebrews is pointing everything back to Jesus. Old Testament, Melchizedek, Abraham, Moses pointing to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus that God has made these promises to Adam, to Noah, to David. And everything points to Jesus. Melchizedek points to Jesus that he will do what he has promised. He is doing what he will promise. We just got to cling on to him. He has begun it already. We cling to him. The reason that some have left the faith, like I said, is that they've missed clinging clinging on to the beauty of Jesus as the great high priest and the king of peace. Worship team, would you guys come forward? I want to close by reading chapter 6, verse 17. So when God deci- desired to show more convincingly, convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by Two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. See, what that passage is saying is that God so desired to solidify his promises for us that he had Jesus lead us into the most holy place. He had Jesus go in front of us, this forerunner, to lead us into the most holy place that Israel could imagine, this sacred spot only for the high priest once a year to come and make atonement on our behalf, this very special place Jesus comes into. Jesus comes into and he leads us in there. One of my favorite passages in Scripture is that when Jesus was on the cross and he gave up his life, Scripture says that the veil of the temple was split in two from top to bottom. No man ripped this monstrous cloth, this thick cloth separating us from God's sacred space, but God did from the top down to us. He split it open. Jesus' death went before us and allows us this sacred space that nobody could ever get into, but now we can because of Christ. The other week, I got, got to do a, uh, a wedding last Sunday, and um, I thought the wedding was beautiful, and I talked to the bride, it was Sarah's sister, afterwards, and she's like, yeah, I forgot the veil. I forgot the, we, we, everything was great except for, I forgot the veil. And I said, ah, oh, veils are old anyway, who needs a veil? And I said this, I said, he already knows who's marrying, it's not like a surprise, right? I never understood the point of a veil at a wedding, like, I knew what you looked like. That's one of the perks, one of the reasons I married you. Like, I, I think you're beautiful. Like, wh- why, why do we have veils, right? It's like hiding some mystery. It's, it's hiding some, something, keeping something back until, ta-da, now you can see. And what I want you to understand this morning is that we as the bride of Christ already know, we already know what he looks like. Jesus split it so we could see, this is God. This is God. He's not a secret. He's not, he's not hiding from you. He, he's not something that you have to do all these things and pay this price so that someday you could earn to see the face of God, the beauty of God. Jesus says, I, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We don't need a curtain anymore. And, and anybody who wants to can come. Anybody who wants to, to, to just be with the Father can just be with the Father. There's, there's no price. There's no hidden secrets. It's just open. J.D. Greer says this, what keeps you from God is not sin. What keeps you from God is not inability. What keeps you from God is your own pride. Jesus has done everything, and all we have to do is say, yeah, I need it. 
Let me, let me just come on in and receive it. Your sin doesn't keep you from God. Jesus dealt with that already. Jesus already handled that whole thing. It was nailed, your scripture says your sin was nailed to the cross. It was already sacrificed for you. Your sin was sacrificed so you didn't have to be sacrificed. Uh, do, you, do you get this this morning? I want to ask this question. How do you approach the Father? How, how do you approach him? Do you see him as distant? Do you see him as a cosmic genie? In Christ, we know that he is neither. He's not distant and he's not the one who just fixes everything. He is the one who has suffered on our behalf and brought us into the throne of grace. He is approachable and he is good. Jesus is both the suffering and sympathetic priest and he is our just and perfect king of peace. I love that, that Melchizedek, this king of righteousness is what the name literally means. The king of Salem literally means the king of peace. He is this king of peace. He's this king of righteousness. This is who Jesus is. Do we see him as the suffering, sympathetic priest and this great, perfect king of peace and righteousness? Our prayer times, your prayer times, any time you spend with the Father should reflect this reality. If we approach God with fear, and I'm not saying holy reverence, we should absolutely have reverence because it's not in arrogance that I come, but it is in boldness that I come before him, knowing what Jesus has done. Your prayer time should reflect this, that we just get to be with him. We just get to talk and dialogue with him because the veil is split. He's already done the work for us. We don't need another priest. You don't need me to approach God. Isn't that good news? I don't answer my phone all the time. And truthfully, I'm not always very nice. I do a pretty good job pretending sometimes. I can't be your priest. Your wife, your husband can't be your priest. No president, no king can be your priest. But Jesus is your priest. He's perfect. He's perfect. What I want to do right now, we'll, we'll have a few of our, our prayer team, Lauren, Martin, um, some of our leaders, um, just stand over there. But what I want you to do is I just want to give you space to be, come boldly before the throne of God. As we sing, as we worship, you can sing, you can kneel, you can step up to the altar. We want to give you space this morning. It's earlier than we normally finish, right? So there's time and space here today for you to just come with confidence, seeing that Jesus is the better priest, he's the better king, and I'm coming before the Father because I need Father time. I need daddy time. I need time with my creator. I want him to see my heart. I want him to sympathize. Sometimes we just need somebody to sympathize with us, to suffer alongside of us. And Jesus is a pretty good one. And by pretty good, I mean he's the best. So, so maybe if you need that, if you want somebody to pray with you, our team is here, absolutely here to pray with you. But also if you just want to just soak in his presence, if you want to come before the throne as we worship, this is the moment to do that. Last night, I got a text from our church overseer. Many of you know has been struggling for months with COVID, and God's giving him strength back. He's walking, walking again and getting and one less oxygen. Um, God's doing some cool things. And he texted me last night. He's like, I sense tomorrow is going to be a time of sweet presence with Jesus. He, he didn't know what I was preaching on. He didn't know what I was talking about this. But I sense that today is a moment for some of you to encounter the beauty of the grace of our Father. You can boldly approach his throne here this morning. So if you want prayer over there, that's fine. If you want prayer up here, if you just want to kneel, whatever you want to do, but let this be a space where you cling on to Jesus and boldly approach the Father. Let's do this together.